one day. I think we'll get started. Welcome, everybody. And I saw the front Happy Friday. Happy Sunshine Happy Day. Happy Sunshine Day. So uh, it's a pleasure to kick off again the uh, Timothy Johnson Medical Scholars Series. And I think everybody, most everybody in the room, uh, realizes and appreciates this uh, program is named after Dr. Timothy Johnson, who is one of the founding faculty members of the Virginia Tech Drillian School of Medicine. And who passed away a couple of years ago now, and we named this program in his honor because it represents very much uh, what he thought was important for medical education uh, and really having the interface of science and advancement research tied to uh, clinical skill development and, and learning to be a doctor. So we're very proud to have named this program <coughs> in uh, Dr. Johnson's honor. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Uh, Jerry Nadler, today's speaker, but I first want to also acknowledge a couple other folks in the audience here. Uh, we have Mr. Bob Williams and Mr. Joe Kelleher from the Roanoke Cosmopolitan Club who have sponsored and supported Dr. Nadler's visits and they're very influential in uh, raising funds for diabetes, uh, the Diabetes Foundation. So thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. <laughs> and it is now my <clears throat> honor and privilege to introduce a, a friend and a colleague, Dr. Jerry Nadler from Eastern Virginia Medical School. Uh, Dr. Nadler started out in my hometown. He started out as a medical education, I should say, in my hometown, Miami, Florida. He went to the University of Miami Med Medical School. Uh, he then did his internal residency at Loma Linda University uh, <coughs> Medical Center in California, and then went on to do a research fellowship at the University of Southern California Medical Center in Endocrinology. Uh, from there, he did an advanced research fellowship uh, sponsored by the American Heart Association out in uh, Los Angeles and then joined the faculty at USC Medical Center in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology, uh, where he served as a faculty member for several years. Uh, he went on to become the director of the Diabetes, Endocrinology, and Metabolism Unit at the City of Hope Medical Center in Duarte, California, uh, and then moved out to Virginia, where he became a faculty member at UVA in Charlottesville. It's okay. We won't bring that. We won't mention it. Uh, there he was professor of medicine and served <coughs> Excuse me, as chief of the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism. And then Dr. Nadler moved to Eastern Virginia Medical School about 10 ish or so years ago, uh, where he's chair of internal medicine uh, and an endowed professor. He's been recognized for his contributions in many appropriate ways, including appointed as a fellow of the American Academy of Endocrinology. He won uh, the Virginia Outstanding Scientist Award. Uh, he's received the award from the American College of Physicians, the Master's Award, Master Award for excellence and distinguished contributions in internal medicine. He serves on a number of important editorial boards, including that of the journal Endocrinology. Uh, his research has been fundamental and translational and clinical. It really spans the gamut. Uh, he has made major contributions and developed a whole series of important insights in our understanding lipid inflammatory mediators in uh, diabetic vascular disease, uh, did a lot of the early important work on prostacyclin modulation in the vasculature, uh, control of renin secretion and aldosterone synthesis. Uh, his work uh, on anti-inflammatory therapies for diabetes have been important and foundational and continue to give insights for developing effective therapeutics uh, against uh, these disorders. And so he has really advanced scientifically our understanding of diabetes, but also given us a window into how we can actually manage it and affect it and treat it. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nadler. Please join me in welcoming him. Absolutely, literally the most uh, uh, flat, flattering uh, introduction I've had. Very much. Mm -hmm. And my parents made it rest in peace. We would love to, love to hear it. <laughs> it's quite an honor to be here on a special day where you had your bean topping uh, happening, and, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Mike <coughs> Michael to be uh, invited here and for the Cosmopolitan Club yesterday to give the talk, and then for the honorary uh, lectureship and to meet the students. That was the highlight of the highlight of the day. So, as a physician scientist, as I was saying, uh, I have some personal connections to diabetes, and uh, ever since uh, medical school started a pathway towards, uh, towards understanding diabetes. And so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some research, but also a background about type 1 diabetes, which is thought to be, has thought to be a classical autoimmune disease. But as you'll see as we go along, there have been a few misconceptions. And that's led to some, uh, some delays in, in therapy. And there's some great opportunities ahead. Uh, from a number of investigators for prevention and potentially treatment of the disease. So that's what I want 
I'll focus on two. So the slide's about diabetes. I'm going to focus on type 1 diabetes. But when you know about diabetes in general, it's a global emergency. And every, the only thing I can say about the statistics with diabetes is they're outdated about every week. Mm -hmm. So uh, in fact, last week, the CDC came out with, a, with, a, with data that's showing that our rates have gone up significantly in the United States. But this is a worldwide epidemic. And any of the people who do international health and go back, and they do this a lot of BCU. I'm, I'm sure you probably do that here with your students go back and infect disease, and they treat the water, treat the, uh, the, the uh, soil, prevent, uh, prevent a lot of infectious disease, diarrheal disease. They go back after five, 10 years, what do they find? Diabetes. You go back, we have somebody from Ethiopia who's one of our uh, division leaders. He says in, in Ethiopia, it's epidemic, uh, the rates of diabetes going up. Most is type 2, but we're seeing increases in type 1 also. So what is type 1 diabetes? So uh, there's a nice review in, in Lancet. This came out. This came out actually from one of our endocrine fellows when I was at UVA. And I was telling the students she got a PhD while an endocrine fellow. Very unusual. She, Carmela Evans Molina. She's now at Indiana University uh, uh, and uh, has a tenured position herself. So this is a polygenic chronic inflammatory disease with environmental trigger. Identical twin concordance is on average 50% or less, and some some studies show only 30%. And my son who just graduated from uh, from EVMS last year, he always makes a joke, and that's. Usually says by the second slide, Dad, you're going to say inflammatory. So, so I, I, I kept up with him, and I'll show something else because it is an inflammatory disease. And you can notice I'm not saying autoimmune disease; it's an inflammatory disease with an autoimmune component. So that's the change. So there's no single major gene identified, uh, but it, but certain high risk HLA class two haplotypes are associated with higher risk disease. Turns out that the progression of beta cell loss and symptoms of polyuric polydipsy and ketoacidosis, classical symptoms, you see them more dramatically in kids than in adults. And in fact, in adults, it's a slowly progressive disease often and can masquerade as type 2 diabetes. And it's called LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. The rates of, of type 1 diabetes are increasing worldwide. Unclear why. Maybe it's because the obesity epidemic is driving those few beta cells that are sick from working too hard, no one really knows exactly why. Um, now, most people with type 2 diabetes do not have a relative with the disease. So on average, the number of people with type 1, you ask them, I said, do you, anyone else in your family have type 1? The majority of people will say no. However, if you do have a parent with type 1 diabetes, your risk of getting the disease is greater. The two parents is even greater. So, um, so a, there is a genetic component, but there's clearly an environmental trigger. So, Despite modern insulin delivery methods and continuous monitors, people with diabetes type 1 continue to have increased mortality and risk of the complications, microvascular and macrovascular complications. So there's still an opportunity to prevent or to treat this disease. And then like on this slide, this is a recent study from the type 1 diabetes exchange that follows families with type 1. You see all these devices. Every week there's a new device. They're getting better and better. Technology is getting better and better with this with disease. You're having the... Uh, uh, the older meter is much larger now. You have continuous glucose monitors. You have meters.
case called LADA. That's really slowly progressive type 1 diabetes in adults. That's where you still see autoimmunity. The beta cells function, but the function can be quite variable, and they progress to full type 1, and there's autoimmunity. So when you say on statistically average, anywhere from 5 to 15% of patients you see in the clinic that have type 2 diabetes have this disease. They go slowly progressive to requiring insulin. We don't measure antibodies in these people, but there are a number of them that go on to rapid disease. So the total number of people that have t classical type 1 and type 2, this form of what's called type 2, there's a lot of, is probably upwards of 20% of all people with diabetes, which is still a lot of people, a lot of numbers. So that's why I'm going to bring this up here. Okay. So what are the new trends? Unfortunately, we're seeing more people with type 1 diabetes and more ketoacidosis, both in kids and adults. So there's opportunities to prevention programs. It costs the health system a lot of money. It's also a severe disease for, for the patients. So that's one trend we're seeing. There's new technology. There's, uh, you can do a genetic score on people with type 1 combined with autoimmunity status measuring the antibodies. And that can help identify people that will be more rapidly progressive to full-blown type 1 and losing the beta cells. This is helpful in clinical studies. So if you're going to target population for clinical research to stop the disease, we now have tools that will be very helpful for that. So that's an advance. There's also multiple type 1 diabetic subtypes characterized by various uh, inflammatory signals. And some of the people I met this morning are working on really exciting uh, immune pathways, uh, both T cells, B cells. And clearly, there's clear importance for that regulatory bias. And this, this characterizes the rate of C-peptide, which is a surrogate for insulin, decline and will help stratify patients for trials. For example, if you take a patient, uh, average population of patients with type 1 diabetes, new onset within the first three months, follow them out to a year, 17% of those people will have no C-peptide decline. The majority will have decline, some very rapid, but 17% will not. We now have characterization capabilities of that. So when you do a trial and you're looking for therapies to stop the prevention of disease, you want to take a population of the people that are more rapidly progressing. Now we kind of know that trial, we know that evidence, which is good. And then new checkpoint inhibitors, and I know there's uh, at least one oncologist in the audience here that, uh, that is uh, now probably working with these new therapeutics that are saving people's lives. Uh, these are the checkpoint inhibitors that uh, using uh, antibodies that block either PD-1 or PDL one and what they basically do is activate the T cells in the body to kill off cancers, metastatic cancers that normally would, the patient would succumb very rapidly. They're life-saving. They keep patients alive uh, a lot longer now. The only issue is that these particular checkpoint inhibitors activate type 1 diabetes. And it's interesting because type 1 diabetes occurs even without antibodies. So it's maybe a different form of type 1. So whenever I teach the students or residents uh, fellows in the clinic, I say, tell me about diabetes. What forms of disease do you have? You have type 1. They would say, well, we have uh, type 1. We have type 2. Well, I said there's in between. There's a lot of And I said there's genetic forms. But now we have to talk about a new form, a drug-induced form, uh, which are these checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, every hospital is starting to see more and more of these patients. So I think there's six, six of these drugs approved, and we're going to be seeing more, more of them. Um, not common, but they, they can occur. Okay. All right. So here's some of the classical areas, just to give you a little background about type 1 diabetes that we know. There's been a, a, a wonderful study where they studied a group of uh, children out for 20 years. Start, and they followed them out for 20 years, and they determined what are the characteristics using antibodies, this is an autoimmune disease, they have one autoantibody, two, or three. And if they have basically or no autoantibodies, if you have no autoantibodies, and, and they basically take the starting point are people that have parents with the disease relative, they're high risk, so that's why they picked not the general population, but the high risk. Followed them out, and as you can see here, that if you have three antibodies, you're already pretty far along, and then within the first five years of identifying people in the study, 250 have already come down with the disease, and most of them have come down with the disease within 10 years of getting three antibodies. Versus one antibody, much lower, and no antibodies, some uh, even after 20 years don't have diabetes. So now we know the stages, this is pretty new. There's a starting point that you have, if you have family members with uh, diabetes, particularly parents, your risk of getting the disease is much higher, genetic risk. 
Is an immune activation what's activating the immune system? That's the big question mark, and I'll give you a little answer here soon that might be part of it. The beta cells are attacked, they're damaged, sets up the autoimmune response. Then you get the single antibody, and then you get more antibodies. But look here, when we see a patient, where do we diagnose a patient with diabetes these days? Way down here, clinical diagnosis, based on blood sugar, fasting blood sugar 126, after a meal blood sugar 200, hemoglobin A1C 6.5, with the symptoms, that's the diagnosis. All this time, which can be years, we don't do anything. We can't do anything. We're not screening. We're not screening. We don't know what starts it. So there's a great opportunity, a window of opportunity uh, for treatment here because before the diagnosis. Then when you get clinical diagnosis, you still have time because your beta cells are not all destroyed or damaged or functionally declined. You have an opportunity to be in stage three and four. So there's a number of opportunities uh, for future research here to understand what to do and identify people. So this is another way of showing it. In stage one, uh, there's autoimmunity, normal blood sugar, they're pre-symptomatic, they have antibodies, but there's not even pre-diabetes, so those people are silent. Stage two, they're starting to develop diabetes, they have fasting blood sugar. Anybody in this room has a fasting blood sugar of 100 to 125, that's not normal. You go to your doc and say, my blood sugar is 105, you're doing okay? Well, I'll tell you not doing that. You have to be careful with that. That's not normal. Fasting blood sugar, anything 100 to 125, that's pre-diabetes. Two hour postprandial, 141 it's pre diabetes. Hemoglobin A1C up to 6.4 is normal, but here 5764, it's pre diabetes. Whether you're type 2 or type 1, most people are type 2, on the way to type 2, you have to be careful if you have those parameters. And when you do a type 2, you improve lifestyle. Type 1, not going to help you because it's, a, it's an immune inflammatory disease. Uh, as much, it'll help you if you're obese uh, and overweight to lower sugar, but it might not stop the disease. Stage three is right here, symptomatic. This is generally when we diagnose people and start, start treatment. Okay. All right, so the classical idea of type one diabetes, it's a classical immune autoimmune disease. And in this case, you get the antigen presenting cell that has an antigen, uh, new antigen that activates the antigen presenting cell. It's delivered, delivered to us uh, in a CD4 activated in CD8. Uh, the regulatory T cell, the T, uh, T regs are not working correctly or downregulated, uh, and you get macrophage activating an immune pathway, neutrophil, natural killer cell, all generating its, the cytokines and the killer mechanisms to kill off the pancreatic beta cell, and the CD8 has a, a direct interaction that can cause the killing. So once this is activated, it is a pretty robust, very robust, the immune system is really honed in to do its job and do its damage and to attack the beta cell. I'll just jump right here and say that this is true. It's true. It's classical. The issue is that all therapies to date targeting these aspects of the immune system have not been very effective in reducing the progression of disease. And that's because they forgot about this part here. This is the island. This is the beta cell. So I think that's where things are going now, and they started to go. And they started to go this way, and this is my, I, I paid off my son to show the slide. Uh, this is a slide he, he did when he was at University of Washington, working in research as actually as an undergrad, but he's now back there as a resident. But uh, this, is the, this is an eyelid. The staining is insulin staining. It happens to be a funny staining. I won't go into the thing, but it's a question mark. And uh, he used to say, do you really think you know enough about me? And we don't. So that's the island. We don't know much about the island. And we didn't know much about it because all we had access to were rodents, maybe some large animals. But we couldn't image the islet. We still can't image the islet. We have great brain imaging. We can't image the beta cell in humans. We can't image it that well in animals either. We don't have access to human. You can't biopsy the pancreas and get islets. They did it in Scandinavia, and the study got stopped because you can imagine they got leakage. So we don't know. So now we have human islet samples. It's called the NPROD program, Network for Pancreatic Donors uh, with Diabetes, Organ Donors with Diabetes. When you get organ procurement organizations where people give the gift of life, they pass uh, away, they brain dead, they, they go and they get their organs transplanted to help people's kidney, heart, lung, liver. What do they do with the pancreas? Most of the pancreas are never used. There's very few pancreas transplants. So someone had the great idea 
Mark Atkinson at the University of Florida and Alberto Puglisi at the University of Miami, working with the JDRF, they formed this organization called NPOD. Yep, it's a biorepository at the University of Florida where all the pancreas samples are sent and they're characterized, put into samples, every possible sample for researchers. They get the blood on the patient. They know if they're type 1. They look at the chart. They do a biorepository with data. So now we have access to all these human samples, and it's revolutionized the understanding of uh, diabetes, particularly type 1, in the last five years. And all the new information is now there. Okay, so what has changed? The classical perspective of type 1 is that the loss of pancreatic beta cells that make insulin, over 80%, results in the manifestation of the disease, and the beta cells are virtually absent in established disease. This, the classical thing is such an autoimmune, inflammatory, classical disease that all those cells are destroyed. That's it. Well, I'll show you. It's not quite true. Uh, here's one. So here's somebody from the NPOD. This is, the, this is somebody who had type 1 diabetes, 18 years old, 8 years of type 1 diabetes, with antibodies positive. C-peptide in the blood reflects no insulin being made. Zero. Was on insulin. Pretty, and, uh, pretty normal weight. But when you get the NPOD sample and stain it for insulin throughout the pancreas, all these areas are insulin staining in the islets. Many islets still have insulin stain, but yet the insulin's not released. So now we know, and we actually did proteomics on these samples, it's not all that the cells are being destroyed. They're sick. The machinery's not there. They're not able to convert pro-insulin to insulin. In fact, in this other study here, you can see the metals. This is from Joslin at Harvard. They, they, they give a medal to people that have type 1 diabetes for 50 years. Uh, and, and this particular person was a medalist with type 1 diabetes for more than 50 years. And here you can see tunnel in purple. Those are cells that are being attacked by the immune system. They're dying. But yet there's a lot of brown. Brown is insulin. Insulin staining after 50 years in the island. And there's still, body still trying to destroy the cells. So it's like, uh, my wife used the word whack-a-mole. You're, uh, most people in the room are too young, I don't see those things. But you ever go to the amusement park and you see the thing pop up and you use that, and you know, it's like a whack-a-mole. The island tries to regenerate, but the kids in the immune system kills it. So you don't see C-peptide in many of these patients. So C-peptide. But yet you see and people that have a little bit of C-peptide, even without C-peptide, look at this. You see pro-insulin. This is pro-insulin. This is not functional insulin. But what's released in the blood is impaired insulin. It's not processed normally. So the machinery to release insulin is abnormal, but the machinery to process insulin is abnormal. We just it's not published yet. That's why this paper's under revision. We actually did proteomics. We find that the, uh, the convertase enzymes, two of them, are defective type 1 diabetic samples. That's the, also the learned from NPOD. So it's a new understanding of type 1. It's not just the immune system hones in and kills all his beta cells. The immune inflammatory pathway is damaging the beta cells. But there's hope. There's hope because if you can stop the inflammation, maybe the cells can be functional again. Okay. Uh, the other classical perspective is the islet, like we know from rodents, exhibits uniform insulitis, inflammation, and invasion of those immune cells early in the disease. It's classical autoimmune disease. The inflammatory cells come in right away, and they kill the cells. Uh, I'll show you that's not quite true. So this is a rodent. The NOD mouse is where we've learned most about type 1 up to now. Uh, and that develops uh, inflammatory disease with very rapidly, within usually within six or seven weeks of age, uh, they get the inflammation, all these T cells circling, circulating. And then by eight weeks to 12 weeks of age, most of the beta cells are destroyed. And it's a very rapid, autoimmune, robust disease uh, with almost every islet showing something like this. Here's a human with type 1 diabetes from the NPOC. CD45 staining, uh, presumably for, it's not all T cells, it's, it's, these are immune cells. But look how much insulin staining is, and look what it looks like, the immune cells. Two things, many fewer immune cells and the immune cells are not circling, circulating. This could be like an atherosclerotic lesion, where the cells are, kill, are damaged, and the inflammatory cells come in to do their job. So they're not starting the disease. They're responding to the inflammation in the island. So I think that's what's happening. And so it's different. Right. The third thing is uh, here about the, about the uh, 
autoimmunity doesn't trigger the disease. Uh, that's the classical thing that autoimmunity triggers disease is beta cell death, and the beta cells and victims are immune directed process. Okay, this is a summary of a lot of data from the uh, Evans Molina study. So, what do we know? When you put everything together, and then there's some pictures I'm going to show you this real quickly. So, you don't lose all the beta cells, it's variable loss of beta cells. And you still see a lot of pro insulin, so it's just like I told you that the processing may be altered. But now you're starting to see stress markers, stress markers of immune stress. A lot of people here work on inflammation in different parts. Endoplasmic particular stress markers you're seeing, you see in the remaining beta cells. You know that from NPO. Uh, HLA complex is overexpressed, distribution and severity of insulinitis. All this is, suggests it's a patchy disease, and it could start with an immune inflammatory response in the islet. And here's an example. Here's insulin staining. And here's some immune staining, uh, showing a lot of insulin, immune staining, and some long standing uh, diabetes. Also, the other big thing is exocrine. If diatom diabetes is a standard autoimmune disease just going to the beta cell, from NPOD, we know that the volume of the pancreas, which is mostly digestion, exocrine, is reduced in most people with type 1 diabetes. So it suggests something's coming to the pancreas and more home, homing in on the beta cell, but the exocrine pancreas is involved. And then here you see uh, inflammation. Here's an here's a, a, a islet that's uh, pretty good. Here's the inflammatory cells. Here's an islet from a long-standing type 1 patient with type 1 diabetes. No inflammatory cells. <clears throat> and now you see fibrosis, which is the end pathway of inflammation without autoimmunity. So it's quite variable, and it's more in line with something is happening at the islet pancreas level, probably first, and then triggering the immune system. So what the dogma is uh, shown here is that the beta cell dysfunction and antigen production precede the development of autoimmunity. So inflammation, could it be a virus, a viral trigger, multiple hits against the virus that's going to the pancreas, it's an enterovirus, and has a propensity to go to the beta cell. We now know that some of these viral receptors, don't ask me why, some of these viral receptors are on the beta cell in the islet, not the other cells. They go to the beta cell, they cause inflammatory signaling, you get translational abnormalities, ER stress, beta cell stress, death. New antigen exposure, we now know, and one of the top immunologists in the world has just changed his view. He said that we, he's identified an inflammatory-related new antigen that involves the insulin peptide that goes out to the circulation that he thinks triggers the immune system. He got a cell paper. So, uh, so that, then you start the autoimmunity. So in other words, if we're going to treat this disease, either prevent it from full progression or stop it in the first place, we can't ignore this part. So far, that part has been ignored. The only part that's been treated is the autoimmunity. And all the, ther all the therapeutic trials have been targeting autoimmunity. They haven't worked. Nobody's targeted this yet because so two reasons. We didn't know about it until recently, number one. And number two, we still don't know the exact pathways in here to stop the inflammation. And probably we're going to need a combination approach at some point. If it is a virus, which we think it is in a number of people, maybe a vaccine could be effective. That's the, that's the hope. So there actually is a group called the NPOD viral working group, and we're part of that. It's a worldwide consortium, big science. You ask the question, is type 1 diabetes initiated by a virus? If so, what virus it is, what's the sequence, and then can a vaccine be generated to prevent the disease? And we're the proteomic center of worldwide consortium. We're doing that at Eastern Virginia Medical Schools. Uh, as vice dean of research, I got them the latest and greatest. Uh, they like tools, you know, toys. People in the research lab like the best toys. I know you have the best MRIs here, the other to toys. We get, we get the best proteomics. I think we're the lead proteomics uh, in Virginia. And then we got them the best tool. We've identified, I'll give you a little hint, it looks like a Coxsackie virus uh, sequence that's there. And it's amenable to a vaccine. So it looks like, looks like we have some, uh, some leads there. So we were part of a, uh, 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 this lead article that came out. And in other words, not only just understanding what virus, but what does the virus do to the human island? So we collaborate with an investigator at the University of Massachusetts. And we asked a question with uh, Dr. Wang. She's actually an infectious disease physician that's interested in uh, metabolic disease. And she asked the question, what happens if you take the Coxsackie virus 
and infect it to human islets. Does anything happen? Do you get the pathways that mimic type 1 diabetes? So that fits the, the postulates that this could be involved in disease. No one wants to spend money, a huge amount of money, developing a vaccine during trials unless you know two things. Which virus it might be, and number two, if you find the virus, is this virus going to the island? Is this virus causing this damage that you think it's causing? And so this is a summary of some of the work, and I'll show you one slide from it, but our ongoing NPOD studies indicate that pancreatic and subjective type 1 have proteomic signatures consistent with Coxsackie infection. We observe distinct profiles and proteomic changes, upregulation of type 1 interferons, and other inflammatory cytokines that are directly linked and directly similar to what you see in human type 1 diabetes and what you can mimic the disease by taking these interferons and cytokines, putting them on the islet, and cause the damage to type 1 diabetes. So this is following Coxsackie B4 challenge. We don't know if that's the Coxsackie exact subtype, but with vaccines these days, you can get up to, like in flu vaccines, you can get up to multiple subtypes. So it's probably more than one Coxsackie subtype, but you can probably get it to one vaccine. All right, so here's just a, a sampling of, from the publication of the proteomic signatures. I'm not going to go through all of these, but some of these are very familiar to those of you that are involved in immune inflammatory disease. They're the classical uh, interferon uh, inflammatory pathways that are linked post-viral infection. And we see these are actually in human islands after Coxsackie infection, usually after three to four days. It doesn't occur after the first day. So we, we see the stats, we see HLAs, we see the interferons getting activated, uh, and uh, this can be useful for biomarkers, because some of these will go into the blood. That's part of one of our projects. And also, this could be involved in uh, further targeting if you want to develop uh, therapeutics. OK. So it turns out that uh, ever since I was a fellow, I worked on an inflammatory lipid pathway that we start off with atherosclerosis, and it's involved in atherosclerosis. It turned out that this pathway was kind of a fortunate. Uh, we weren't really looking. We were looking for controls. And we said, well, the pancreas does, it shouldn't express this enzyme, lipoxygenase. Uh, and in fact, in a normal non-diabetic donor, you see nice insulin staining in the eye with almost no 12 LO. But as soon as someone starts getting inflammation in the islet, the 12 LO expression in the islet goes up. There's pre-diabetic type 1 with antibody positive. Here's a type 1 donor that still has some insulin. You see a lot of 12 LO. Here's a type 2 uh, donor from the MPOD seeing insulin and a lot of 12 LO. So 12 lipoxygenase is, uh, I'm going to go through it in a minute, is a lipid, lipid that generates inflammatory mediators that we think is the signal by which maybe the virus and the cytokines kill and cause damage to the beta cell. So it's, uh, that's there. So, so this is a pathway. Everyone here has taken aspirin, I bet. Everyone's taken a non-steroidal, a rocadonic acid, fatty acid, generates cyclooxygenase. Everyone knows about prostaglandins. That's the COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors. Anybody that's studying asthma, you're studying the 5 lipoxygenase pathway and leukotrienes. But a rocadonic acid can go to the 12 lipoxygenase and it forms the 12, uh, the oxygenation on the 12 uh, carbon of arachidonic acid in C20. That's the 12 HP, 12 heat, and then the 15 lipoxygenase. We found that the 12 lipoxygenase is the main pathway in human islets, and it generates these highly inflammatory lipids that can cause beta cell damage and cell death. Right now, there's, up until very recently, there's no drug, well, still now, there's no drug you can take in the clinic that blocks this pathway. There wasn't even any selective drug you can order from a company uh, to do this. So it's been a real limitation in the field because no one wanted to develop a, a drug or a, against something that doesn't do anything. So recently, people got excited about it. So, so why is Paul Hypotenuse a target for uh, diabetes treatment? I'll go through this quickly. Uh, in a mouse, just like in uh, other genes, you delete the 12 LO gene. Fortunately, mice is healthy. You don't need this enzyme. We can go through and question and ask what does the enzyme do normally. But in a normal, healthy animal, you eliminate the gene. The yeah, animal's fine, but the one thing is, if you're a high-fat diet, which is like a McDonald's uh, high-fat diet, uh, you prevent beta cell dysfunction and some resistance adipose inflammation. We published that in a group in uh, San Diego did it very fancy, much fancier than we did. 12 LO deletion global prevents type 1 diabetes development. We showed that a number of years ago. 
12 hour deletion promotes cardiac recovery after MI, and, uh, MI induction. It's good for the heart uh, if, if you eliminate this pathway. That was shown by a group in Alabama. Human islet is treated with cytokines that mimic type 1. This expression goes up. Islet dysfunction and death happens. And we published that. 12 AC, an important mediator, inflammatory cytokine and inducing islet dysfunction. So if you add this product, I'll show you some data. Very quickly, uh, within a few hours, can cause beta cell dysfunction. And there's expression of these enzymes in pre-diabetic and diabetic individuals. I showed you that data from the NPOD just recently. And then uh, there's some genetics in this. It's, it's, it's very difficult because, again, this enzyme is sitting there, but the enzyme depends upon the fatty acid. So it's not a, a straight pathway where you can find genes and directly within the gene. It depends on the metabolism of the fatty acid. And the fatty acids, where do they come from? The diet. So, so this is where diet can come into play about how to modulate this enzyme as well. Uh, there's a receptor, GPR31. That pathway with Alex 12 is involved in hepatic inflammation as well, maybe NASH, which is another way this is. Here's an uh, earlier study that we did where we added uh, 12 heat. I'll just show you this. Here's some human, uh, human islets. You have low glucose, high glucose. They release insulin to high glucose. That's what beta cells, beta cells do. You add 12 S heat at one nanomole of concentration within four hours, 100 nanomole within four hours. You can see you reduce the function of the islet of the beta cell. You add 12 SC at 100 nanomole overnight. This is a, a cell death assay. A lot of apoptosis. You can see the apoptosis percent goes way up. So fortunately, most of us that don't have ongoing inflammation in our islets don't have this enzyme. I don't think you want this enzyme, because this enzyme is generating these products. Within four hours, it can cause the beta cells not to work very well. If it stays sustained high, uh, you can get uh, cell death. So this is one pathway you wouldn't really want to activate in the normal, in the islet, in the adult. Okay. So you knock out the 12 LO and the females are the ones that get type 1 diabetes. This is a reverse kind of slide. Percent without diabetes, this means that about 70% of these animals, NODs, over 30 weeks will get spontaneous type 1 diabetes. In females, if you knock out 12 LO, we've only seen a few in our whole history, which a number of years, they're highly protected from getting type 1 diabetes in the mouse, that's a global knockout. We just recently uh, did a study with uh, Sarah uh, Tersey, University of Indiana, to do a phlox, we have a phlox mouse, and we asked the question, if you eliminate this gene just in the islet, what happens? And here's a streptozotocin, low dose, you give it over five days, it induces diabetes, like a type one picture, and over five days, uh, within 10 days afterwards, they start going up, blood sugar 600, Impaired glucose tolerance, you can see pretty high blood sugar. They don't handle glucose very well. In the wild type, the islets lose their insulin staining. So here, here they're becoming very dysfunctional. They're losing insulin staining. The knockout, just in the pancreas, here's the nice islets staining before the drug. Nice glucose tolerance. Here's after streptozotocin, over 30 days after streptozotocin, the toxin. The islets are still fine, and the blood sugar is normal. So it's, all, it's totally protective. You might say, well, streptozotocin doesn't mimic type 1. So what happens in the NOD, which is a very robust, aggressive form of type 1? It's probably more aggressive than we see in humans. So that's, this is data that's not, I actually got this data two days ago. Uh, from Sarah Tersey, this is ongoing R01, where we made the, we bred the phlox animal into the NOD, and we targeted, deleted, time deleted using tamoxifen induced. So this is tamoxifen inducible <coughs> deletion at six weeks of age. So we let the animals, NODs, develop normally. Six weeks of age, we then eliminate 12 LO in the islet, in the pancreas. So this is, this is a simulation situation to if we can't eliminate genes in people, but what if we had a drug? What if we had a pathway? a drug that could stop this pathway in, in young kids or adults. This is the simulation of that. And here's the, uh, the NODs, all the controls, the flux, flux, free positives, are basically controls. They all develop uh, type 1 diabetes as expected. About 75% get diabetes by 25 weeks. The animal, just with 12 LO eliminated in the island, remember, NOD is supposed to be a robust autoimmune disease. The immune system kills, kills the islet cells. We're not eliminating 12 LO in the immune system, only in the island. 
protected. So it further validates the idea that type 1 diabetes probably starts in the islet, starts in the pancreas, because here we get high protection. Okay, enough of the animals, enough of the uh, uh, gene knockouts. I'm a physician. I like doing this research, but how do we get to people? And we get to people, we can't eliminate these genes. We have to develop a, uh, a treatment. So this is big science that we did. We did this big science, fortunately, without uh, industry. To start with, we, did, we were very fortunate to work academically and had no, uh, no strings attached. We were very fortunate because I started working with Ted Holman as a biochemist at UC Santa Cruz, who was very interested in lipopsinases. He had a partnership with David Maloney at the NIH. And the NIH has an interesting branch called the NCATS, which is basically a therapeutic branch of the NIH. They do drug development. If you ever visit, I would recommend you all visit. Not the Bethesda, it's, it's nearby, near the FDA. They actually have the robots, just like a big pharma company. They can screen for drugs if they're interested in it. And they happen to be interested, got very lucky, they were interested in lipoxygenases, screening lipoxygenase inhibitors. So I showed our data to Ted and Dave. They said, well, it looks like 12-LO might be involved in a disease. We're going to start screening and looking for drugs. So they identified, he made a, a large, robust library and, and screened for the drugs. Ted Ullman did the biochemistry for selectivity with HITS. And then the drug was sent to uh, Raghu and his team to look at zebrafish validation, uh, and then mouse validation, sent to us, which would do the human islet validation. And this is our current R1 grant, uh, and we're going to go to uh, move ahead on it. But, so out of this consortium, we identified two leads. They had numbers, because they're not drugs yet, so they have names. ML355 is the lead. It's very effective to reduce, takes the rocketonic acid here and inhibits the enzyme, so you reduce 12 heat production. It's pretty specific for 12 LO. It doesn't block 5 LO. It doesn't block 15 LO too well and 15 off. So it's at the therapeutic effect, it's submicromolar and it's uh, selective. Also, not shown here, we've done screening. It doesn't affect any kinases, doesn't affect any other pathway. To date, it looks like it's safe. We haven't gone into patients yet, but it looks very promising. Does it work? Yes, it works very nicely in human islets, at least. Here's uh, an example showing you glucose-stimulated insulin secretion and insulin secretion index. I'll show you the index first, because that's showing you how well those islets, human islets, work in the basal state after you add inflammatory cytokines, interferon, uh, gamma, uh, TNF and interleukin-1, the triple cytokine cocktail that simulates type 1 diabetes. You reduce the insulin secretion index here, you have the inhibitor at the same time as the cytokines, uh, they do very well. They also work with glutamethylide because they work after the closing of the K-channel. It's a little technical, but basically the islet, remember the islet has multiple pathways of functioning. Glucose comes in, has to get oxidized, activates ATP, you close the uh, potassium channel, it releases insulin secretion. Glomecumide is going to close the potassium channel, and here it basically shows that the, uh, the cytokine effects has effects, but when you add the inhibitor, uh, it also helps that. So it's post-potassium channel. It works before and after, basically. So it really improves islet function. We also did uh, zebra, I'm sorry, seahorse, but mitochondrial function and informs mitochondrial function. Here's perifusion data. This is showing uh, first phase and second phase insulin secretion. It's the more, more human uh, physiology. When you have glucose, you get first phase, second phase insulin secretion. It's happening in you and I. Uh, and uh, you had cytokines. The first phase insulin secretion is reduced. Second phase is reduced. Uh, here, when you add the drug, you pretty much restore first phase insulin secretion in all these human donors. Uh, here's the uh, summary of the data. Simulation index went that uh, got improved. Here's the first phase insulin secretion, totally improved. And uh, we also have uh, reduction uh, in apoptosis. So, the, and this is the JCN paper which I sent. It shows very nicely that as much as we can do with human islets in the laboratory, this drug looks like it's functionally going to be very effective. We don't know for sure. Uh, but until we go forward, but it's very promising. Okay, I, back to the virus. This is unpublished data, too, from uh, uh, Jennifer Wang. We're very excited about this, very new. She adds the virus to the human islets to simulate what might happen in type 1 diabetes. We ask the question, does the virus, when it's inducing all these inflammatory pathways, which I showed you, and inducing beta cell dysfunction, 
is it activating 12-LO expression? Here's Alex 12, the gene for 12-LO. Within three days, you can see almost 100-fold upregulation of 12-LO. So, and, and we are measuring 12 heat, the product, to see if it also goes up, probably will. So it's very exciting. It suggests the virus also activates this pathway. So, and, and then Jennifer Wang has also done this study where she actually added a center of the inhibitor and she looked at insulin content as well as insulin secretion using perifusion. And you can see here with ML355, uh, you get improved insulin secretion, perifusion response in the drug treated even with the virus present. So we're excited that it suggests that the uh, blocking 12-LO, reducing 12-LO activity could be therapeutic in start halting the disease or lowering the progression of the disease and improving the function of the island. So at any stage of the disease, as long as there's some insulin production, the therapeutic may help. Okay. So what's 12-LO doing? So in the island, in order to get insulin secretion, we need glucose, glucose stimulation. It turns out that high glucose, chronic high glucose activates 12-LO. The virus isn't on here in this review, but now we'll put the virus on in the new review that we're doing now. 12 LO, and 12 LO can get activated. The product 12 LO itself, not shown here, has some effects. When you activate 12 lipoxygenase, it activates superoxide. So superoxide itself could be damaging and kindle nitric oxide. That's one thing the enzyme does. The enzyme also generates lipid inflammatory products that generate NOx enzymes that react that form reactive oxygen species, activate P38 NAP kinase, June kinase that induce oxidative stress, ER stress, beta cell dysfunction, and death. It turns out that the enzyme products also knock down this transcription factor called NERF2. NERF2 is responsive for increasing the antioxidant protection. So the enzyme generates these products that reduce the protective transcription factor, which worsens the process. So in many different ways, activation of this enzyme could be central to beta cell dysfunction and it's one of the pathways we're focusing on. So, so in summary, diabetes is a worldwide growing epidemic, both type 1 and type 2. So there's promising approaches for future prevention and intervention therapy. The prevention therapy could be a vaccine against, uh, against Coxsackie virus. Intervention could be combination autoimmune therapy plus maybe uh, anti-inflammatory targeting in 12 LO particularly. Type 1 local inflammation is in the island, appears to be the primary event it induces beta cell damage, and that leads to autoimmunity, and then you get the vicious cycle. And autoimmunity is involved, but, but this could be the first step. Uh, and a virus may trigger inflammation in susceptible individuals, and 12-LO expression in the key tissues, uh, we believe, plays a role in type 1, and targeting 12-LO may offer a novel approach to diabetes treatment and prevention. With full disclosure, we, uh, when I started this work, actually started this work at City of Hope, continued at University of Virginia, but really it took off at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Five different institutions, including the NIH, patented uh, the, the small molecules. Um, one of the many patent holders, because uh, we did the work, some of the work. It's been licensed into a small company. I have nothing to do with the company. They want me to be an advisor. I haven't agreed yet, because I, I, I don't know about conflicts and you know, things like that. But, uh, but uh, it's exciting, because it's doing Academics, we can develop the ideas, we can develop the technologies, uh, but ultimately you need industry to move things forward to the clinic, and there's nothing bad about industry when they're doing the work like that, because that's how you get through the FDA. You can't get through the FDA typically in an academic institution, so it's a partnership. So that's, uh, that's where things are right now in these inhibitors. So in type 1 diabetes, there's three stages, stage 1, 2, and 3, right now, it's, it's variable in terms of the development of type 1, where you get the different uh, uh, onset of disease and spotty. But this is right now where we're targeting people. If we have better biomarkers or better preventive therapies that are safe, we can start people way back here. So a vaccine, for example, is very safe. There's really no harm in blocking Coxsackie. It's a cold virus. It's not going to stop the common cold, because it's a common virus that causes common cold. But, but the Coxsackie viruses, we're all exposed to it, but only certain people with a genetic tendency get the disease. It's probably multiple hits. And that's why when you talk to kids or parents or young adults or adults with type 1, they typically say, I had a virus infection three or four months before I came down with the disease. That last virus infection probably didn't cause the disease in total, 
but it probably put them over the edge because it was a repeat infection. So, uh, so potentially if there's a vaccine, it could help. So we have a lot of collaborators, and that's uh, really the name of the game uh, is Day in Science. If you have a wonderful institute that uh, Dr. Friedlander set up here, you have a lot of your collaborators locally. In, in a lot of areas now, we don't. But we do a lot of collaboration locally, Eastern Virginia. But our beta marker team for, is at Indiana. We work with people in California. The NPOD-B consortium is really all over the world, including Albert Puglisi and University of Miami, University of Massachusetts, and the NCATS branch, and our uh, funders, the NIH and JDRF, in a lot of these studies. So I want to thank you for your attention, and, uh, and any questions? You've talked a lot about the Coxsackie uh, virus and your thought on sort of long-term infection and the relationship with uh, innate immune receptors like toll receptors sort of being a source of the induction of autoimmunity. So a lot of things in that question. Um, so the way the virus, and I'm not the virologist on the team, but the virologist on the team says that the way this virus works it becomes a replicative defective virus. So it's not, it's not, it basically does its in initial damage and it basically goes away. It's not reinfecting. And then you get reinfected from the outside. That's my understanding. It's not replicating internally. So that's thought the way the virus does it. Whether it does it through the toll receptors, I'm not sure exactly. I just know that the interferons and uh, cytokines get activated. We don't know yet exactly which targeted pathway. But there are, from the proteomics I just showed you, um, what it is. What we're doing now, which we didn't show here, we work with Doug Melton, who's in Harvard. He has the latest and greatest way of making stem cells from beta cells. He can take your skin and turn it into beta cells, uh, so SC beta cells. We're collaborating on those cells, and we just infected those with the virus, and they show similar signals. So it looks like that's what we're going to hone in. So we don't know that. Um, so that's, a, um, that's the, the point of where I was saying, we had, was there any third part that you said? I think I answered most of it. But, yeah, yeah you, you pretty much answered most of it. Okay. Oh. Um, so, Coxsackie virus is, as you know, many have different types of infections. Some of the heart, the uh, right. different tissues, you anticipate that question. So, Coxsackie viruses are one of the most common causes of viral Have you looked at cardiac tissue? In terms of this pathway and your, your uh, lead molecule? Yeah, it's, a, it's so the question was about in the heart. So I didn't talk about it, but other investigators, way back when I was at uh, early in the University of Virginia, in fact, this, this pathway in rodents is activated in inflammation in the cardiac myocyte and fibroblasts. We don't know if the virus does it, but we know that uh, cytokines do it. So I wouldn't be surprised if it would be there, but we've never studied human hearts that are, that are uh, affected by Coxsackie virus. Um, it's a good point. We, we, you know, these days we're focused on research, but uh, but I work on this pathway. So yes, it could be. We know it, it's there in the heart that gets inflamed in rodents. We don't know anything about humans. Question, Jeff. So the question was about type 2 and type 1 is a difference. So it's a good point because I focus in this talk on type 1 that's probably, what's the trigger? The trigger may be a virus, and not a, everybody, but in a lot, maybe a lot of percent. But ultimately then you get the cytokines and immune pathways being activated which turn on an enzyme like this. In type 2, it's probably not the virus, it's probably central obesity, the inflamed adipose tissue. Um, there, and we, the only way I can answer that one uh, mechanistically, to be sure, is that we've done two studies. We've done studies using bariatric surgery samples from diabetic and non-diabetic people. And in diabetic people, the central fat, one of the only genes that's upregulated is tormolo. So we know it's there, we know the cytokines make it go up. So we think it's a trigger by, by that. The other one is we've done it, published a study. If you 
target the 12LO in the mouse, just an adipose tissue, you prevent beta cell damage in the type 2 mouse. So it looks like that's why lifestyle makes such a great difference. The best way of preventing type, type 2 diabetes, and I told this to the Cosmopolitan Club, I said, said it'll be easier. We know how to prevent type 2 very well, but it's not so easy. Uh, type 1, we, we don't know all things, but it's probably going to be easier. So type 2 is probably driven by central obesity. Inflammation is, is the final common pathway. The cytokines, not the virus. Now you get virus on top, but who knows? We do know that the COXAC, interesting enough, the, the receptor for the COXAC co the receptor is only on the beta cell. I don't know why, but it's uh, not there. So that's, uh, it's there. So theoretically, that could worsen the disease, but typically it's central. Yep. Is the idea that uh, there's a different immune susceptibility to Kawasaki virus in people predisposed to develop type 1? Yeah, there's certain HLA subtypes that, uh, that are high risk. So there are high risk subtypes. Uh, it's now, so, so in other words, it's probably a genetic, polygenetic disease with an environmental trigger. So we all, everyone in this room, I would say almost everyone in this room, has that environmental exposure to Coxsackie? You know, it yields my infectious disease college here, right? And most of us, if you do antibody. So we bought, but but only a certain people get type one, and that's where the genetic component comes. Now we don't know that ahead of time unless we do that on everybody, but we do know that parent, if you have a parent. So really, it's a question of genetic tendency plus the environmental. Trigger. So how would that affect your vaccination strategy? Give it to everybody. Would it work as well? Ask the people that treat like, polio vaccine. But would you worry about the vaccine not working as well for people that can't mount the best immune response to Coxsackie? Well, if these people are on cancer getting immunotherapy or something like that, it's another story because they won't generate the response to the vaccine. But the general philosophy of vaccinations are that there really is very minimal harm and they're used for general population benefit. I'm not quite old enough to, uh, to know about the origin of the polio vaccine, but, but I think that polio was such a devastating disease, but it was not the majority of the population that gets, gets polio, right? But, but how many people in this room have gotten the polio vaccine? So if, if, if you can save people from getting type 1 diabetes or a lot of, which is still a pretty high number, by giving a vaccine. Now, they won't start the study like that. They'll start the study to see if it works with the highest risk people. And then it'll be beyond me. I'll never be that, that decision maker to see, like you said, why we, they're going to probably take the highest risk people and you can, you can find parents that have children with children. And they said, I would do anything to keep my child from getting type 1. And can I have a safe therapy? Because now they're doing therapies that are not exactly all safe. So if you can take a vaccine that, that might work, no promises to study, that's where we'll start. And, and probably with two parents, two parents with type 1, they'll look at the offspring. Follow the antibody. As soon as the first antibody, they might not do any patient with no antibodies, but as soon as the first antibody comes up, that tells you that something started the inflammation. So that's fine. With the uh, complications with from obesity, et cetera, bringing on type 2, with this slow developing type one, which is typically discovered you know, with, with adults, um, do you typically see them also obese or are they more a normal profile of a, a height and weight? So? No, it's a good question. That's a lot. So the late autoimmune diabetes of adult patients, that review uh, is very good. When you look at that patient, they look just like a type two. They, they're insulin, they're insulin resistant. Even some type one, because it, it'll be easy to so that you can't tell. In fact, uh, uh, a few a few months ago, a fellow in endocrine came in and, and presented a patient to me. We almost often don't in endocrinology see a see a patient right off the bat, but it was a, a, a pretty healthy guy. Uh, he was uh, a fireman, a little overweight, big guy, but not super obese. He was obese, but uh, mildly obese. His wife studied to be a nurse. He started getting polyurethane, urinating a lot, drinking a lot. And she said, I bet you have diabetes, you know? Go to this uh, urgent care, doc in the box, they call it. And the blood sugar was 400. The, the uh, on-call doc said, you have type 2 diabetes, here's some metformin, a common medication. Take it and go to the diabetes center. They came to us. Uh, blood sugar was 220 on half the dose of metformin. It's therapeutic. The fellow saw the patient, presented to me, and said, what do you have? I asked the fellow, what, what kind of disease 
I always done the same thing. I said, what kind of diabetes is the patient? I said, a patient has type 2 diabetes, partially treated with metformin, let's up the dose to twice, twice a day. I said, wait a minute, did you uh, ask the patient any family history of diabetes? No, let's go back. No family history of diabetes. Mm -hmm. Did you look at the lipids, fasting lipids? The classical fasting lipids of, of a patient uh, with type 2 should have high triglycerides, low HDL. The patient had pretty normal. I said, let's measure antibodies, just on the hand. I don't measure antibodies in every patient. Comes to let's measure antibodies to see if there's autoimmune disease. The antibodies were sky high. So the person had, had late night. But look, just looking at her even to an endocrine fellow was type 2. So like I said, up to 15% of people in the average clinic that are called type 2 have this disease. They're the ones that go more rapidly onto insulin. They start with pills and go onto insulin. So right now we don't have an approved therapy to slow the disease. But I can tell you there's therapies I would recommend to slow down the disease to have improved therapy. And not, not something you read, other things. Yep. Uh, I was curious, you talked a little bit about um, chronic inflammation as a generalized issue. Now, some would like to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was wondering if um, you see that specifically with like, chronic inflammation of the pancreas, like in cystic fibrosis, or like, if somebody has chronic gallstones, something like that, mm -hmm. do you see a higher incidence of, of diabetes, diabetes or like vada or yeah. It's a good question because, again, this is targeted inflammation. Once you get to the inflammatory cascade, you get the final common pathways. You get the, so in cystic fibrosis, yes, there is, uh, it's not been worked out, but there clearly is a higher rate of diabetes, and diabetes worsens the infection. So it's a vicious cycle, so you treat very early. I don't know about the other ones, but the, uh, another one which is very interesting, this relates to the uh, oncology. If you get a new onset of diabetes, it's the other way around a little bit, but new onset of diabetes in an adult, that looks out of line, this is another form of diabetes in fact, that you can't quite explain. There's something that is inflammatory or locally that's affecting the pancreas, the islets. It might be a high risk of pancreatic cancer. So there is a, a new onset pancreatic cancer uh, in some people that have new onset diabetes as adults and you don't have a quite, and the antibodies are negative, and they're not typically type 2, they're otherwise in good shape. So that's, but that's probably the cancer, the tumor, which probably causes local inflammation. No one knows why. But cystic fibrosis, yes. Pancreatic cancer, yes. Gallstones. Other, but remember, most of the pancreas is inflammation, and uh, in, in, like pancreatitis. Now, chronic pancreatitis, yes. Acute pancreatitis depends how severe. So enough. But, but this is very, what I'm talking about is very targeted more targeted for whatever reason. Now the beta cell is very low in antioxidant enzymes, so it's most susceptible to inflammatory injury compared to other cells. And that's one reason why the beta cells get sick early, people thought. Any other questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so earlier you mentioned that in Ethiopia, type 1 diabetes, or, type, or diabetes in general is reaching epidemic portion. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if there are any similar related projects happening in there that would be able to back up your claims, and, or just something to probably the, you said earlier, the proteomic signatures or family yeah. histories. Is there anything going on there? Um, not as sophisticated as that, but Dr. Elias Siraj, who's now the Diabetes Center Director, and I recruit him as division chief, he's originally from Ethiopia. He trained at the Cleveland Clinic, but he goes back every summer and he's starting a collaborative project with Ethiopia to further understand the disease and the population and what's happening. Because it probably is a little different than, uh, than type 2 diabetes that we see in different populations. So, so yes, if you uh, get my email after, I can put you in contact with Dr. Siraj. Thank you. Very quick question. Oh, is it ML 3335? Yeah, 355. Uh, in terms of the K-channel effect uh, downstream, is there a possibility that what, what we do is make these uh, beta cells sort of hyper-responsive by shutting down the K-channels under any mm. sign that they're showing overly exuberant uh, release inappropriate. The drug itself has no effect on insulin secretion by itself. It's only, um, and it doesn't even affect the glomecomide that closes the K-channel by itself. So if you have the drug by itself, no effect on insulin secretion, healthy island. If you close the K-channel, with a drug that typically closes the K-channel and add the drug without the inflammatory cytokines, no effect. It's only when you uh, 
uh, have the inflammatory influence that has the effect. So, so basically, the expression of the enzyme in the products are extremely low. So the drug looks like it's not having off-target effects, but it's probably not blocking the pathway because there's really not much going on until you have the inflammatory. And so I, I know what you're saying. It, and that's what happens with sulfonylurea is you get the exuberant effects and you get hypoglycemia. So this drug itself has no effect directly, no effect directly when you add the sulfonylurea. It's only when the sulfonylurea effect is, is damaged with the cytokines that you, you, uh, uh, you kind of restore, restore the effect back. So we're not saying it has direct effect. Please join me in thanking Dr. Nadler.